Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to worship. Everyone should get to stand where I stand and to look out at all your faces and to imagine who's with us online today. It's a great opportunity to look and see the church, a church that comes expectant and waiting for what God is going to do. My friends, as you've come to worship, we have set the stage for you to worship. We have prepared wonderful music. There's hymns to be sung. There's scripture that will be read. I will share from the pulpit, and God will do God's work if your heart is open and you're willing to receive. God is faithful. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. 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 Welcome to worship. Let's sing together our first hymn. Please be seated. I want to join my brother Jeff's voice in welcoming you to worship. Now is the time that we get to bring our hearts together, our spirits together, to pray with one another, for one another, and for this world in which we live. Let's pray. Lord God, source of life, living one, we give thanks to you for this day when we can indeed join our hearts, our minds, and our spirits in praise of you. You are the living God who is beyond our comprehension, far beyond us in both glory and love, and yet you choose to enter into our world. You choose to enter into our condition to take the path of vulnerability. You became one of us, O oh God, that we might be turned to your life-giving way. In this act of humility, you have showed us what true power actually looks like. You've shown us the way of love, which is stronger than death. And for this, we praise you, and we thank you. In scripture, O oh Lord, we often hear of the great rivers that water the earth, that bring life and sustain both humankind and creation. And yet in our own world, we see and hear of rivers that run dry in too many places. 
In your word, O Lord, we hear of green fields and trees that provide shade and food. And yet in our world, we see forests laid waste, ecological disaster which threatens the very life of this world. We know, O God, that your will is that creation should live and thrive. And yet so many of us struggle in the face of violence, loneliness, and neglect. We need you, Lord, to act. We need you to act on behalf of all people. We need you to turn the hearts of the powerful to the powerless. We need you to turn our own hearts to one another and to the earth from whom we are all derived. Oh Lord, we pray this day for an end to war. We pray for an end to violence in our streets, our homes, our schools. We pray for food for those who hunger and for justice for those who are crushed. We pray for friendship for those whose lives are marked by loneliness. And we pray that we might be a part of that work. And where we have failed, O oh Lord, to turn to one another in genuine care and hope, we ask that you forgive us and renew us by your spirit that we might be instruments of your peace in this world. We pray also, O oh Lord, for our community, Meeting House Church. May we catch your vision for us as a community, placed here for this time and in this place. May we grow into the people of welcome you are calling us to be, that we might truly be a blessing to others, to the glory of your name and to the good of our neighbor. We pray this day especially for our brothers and sisters who are in need. We lift up all those who are sick, those who are in need of healing, and those who are preparing to go into surgery, including especially Jean Mastain, Randy Wheeler, Lynn Teschendorf, David Getch, and all those whom we hold in our hearts. Lord, we pray that you spread out your healing hands over the lives of these, our brothers and sisters, and that you bring life back into their bodies, their minds, and their souls. Be with their friends and families as they surround them to support them. Be with their doctors. Give them wisdom. We pray also for Millie Gudermann at the death of her mother, Ellie Dill and Ron Backlund at the death of his brother, Duane. We grieve with our friends and their families, and we join them in commending their loved ones into your loving care and your eternal embrace. And may they know your peace in the midst of their grief. We also, oh God, this day, join with David and Chris Henderson who have given today's flowers and we give thanks for the power and the beauty of music which genuinely has the ability to speak to our soul and to lift our heart. In all of these things, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom. Please join in singing the Amen.
Thank you, brother. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you for leading this in that song. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> great. It's great to be here with you. My name is Christian. I'm the teaching minister here at Meeting House Church. I also want to extend a welcome to our friends, wherever you may be worshiping across the country or at home, cabin. We hope that you know that you are loved and that you are joined by the power of the Spirit that's also here in our midst today. We have a lot of things going on, as usual, I think it'd be fair to say, in the life of our community, even though it's summertime and we're, of course, gearing up for the school year to begin. The first thing is, uh, I just want to let you know about a couple things that sort of have already begun or have just happened that are, I think, moments to celebrate in the life of our community. Uh, last week, we had Meeting House Kids Camp. Uh, we had numerous kids come. These were half-day camps, went throughout the week. We got a chance to pour love uh, into the lives of these kids, talk to them about creation, talk to them about Jesus. Um, and I just hope that, that you were able to, to maybe hear about this if your kids or grandkids or others participated. It was a true blessing uh, for all those who were involved. There were numerous folks uh, also involved. Uh, what was it, like middle school, high school counselors, as well as the ministers, et cetera. Uh, so that's an awesome time checking out these pictures up here that are on the roll. Uh, the other thing that just started also last week that is ongoing, of course the, the camp is over, but ongoing is uh, you may know that we are, uh, as a church community, uh, now for the second time in the last three years, I believe, building a tiny house. Uh, the tiny house is parked just outside in the staff parking lot. Uh, that process began. You can see some pictures here on the scroll um, all kinds of work has been going on. I think I'm signed up uh, to work this Thursday. I know you worked last week as well. Uh, other folks, uh, volunteers, ministers, etc. It's just a chance for us uh, to contribute to a mission that is uh, doing everything that it can to engage the question of secure housing and uh, homelessness. Um, there's plenty of spots still available. Uh, and if you have a bulletin, there is a QR code right here. You can check that out after the service and sign up. Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned analog way, you can go and talk to Michelle Steinke, who will be over at the Connection Corner after the service. Last thing I want to note is uh, we are part of a program. I think it's, are we starting it this year? I think it might be starting up this year, but it's the Summer Singers program. Uh, next Sunday, if you, we have a wonderful choir director Music director, Paul Radoy. I don't know that he, I don't, is Paul here today? There he is, right there, all right. And one of Paul's passions is that we all can sing, okay? And I mean, I, and I don't, I'm terrible, but I can still sing, right? I can still make music. You, if you can breathe, you have breath, you can sing. And music is such a powerful thing reaches down deep, deep into us. So there are lots and lots of opportunities that Paul and others have been trying to put forward to encourage more and more singing uh, in, in a broader sense in the congregation. And we have one coming up uh, next summer. This is called the Summer Singers um, Event. If you've ever sung uh, you are, or ever interested in singing, you are invited to come next Sunday at 8.30. Uh, they will be gathering in the Music Center and they will be learning a new anthem from scratch. So that's pretty great. Thank you so much, Paul, for your work here. You're a blessing to our community. Brothers and sisters, uh, uh, today we do not have a dismissal for the kids, I believe. The, that was before um, uh, the service. So uh, I would like to invite you uh, to rise up, greet one another, and pass the peace.
Good morning, friends. The scripture for today is James 4, 1 through 12. I invite you to listen with your souls and with your hearts to how God is speaking to you this morning. I also invite you, one of the beautiful things about this morning's service is there are so many layers to it. I'm going to read the scripture. You're going to hear some beautiful words from De Jeff. And then our music piece for this morning is a wonderful way to conclude what we're going to learn today. So I, I really invite you to sink deeply into all of this. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are our war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that the scripture speaks to no purpose? Does the spirit that God caused to dwell in us desire envy? But God gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposed the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Therefore, is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? Jenny, I thank you for not only the reading of the scripture, but for your encouragement that I'm going to actually have something worthwhile to hear. That's nice. <laughs> I don't know, and I hope it's not a reflection of past weeks. Yeah, anyway. Let's just pray. Lord God, thank you for this hour. Thank you for Sundays that bring us together, whether by technology or by our cars or our feet. We're grateful that we can be here, and we pray that your spirit would fill this place and lead us in ways that maybe we can't even imagine. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. As we have stated these last few weeks, the book of James is a very challenging letter. But for followers of Jesus, it can offer a helpful, how am I doing on the journey? Self-check. The book of James was written by Jesus' brother who grew up with Jesus and witnessed Jesus throughout his ministry. James writes to challenge Jesus' followers to practice what they believe and to live like Jesus for the good of others. It's the central theme of this letter. Theologians and historians believe G James was written somewhere 
around A.D. 45, so about 45 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. This letter is not directed to a particular ancient church, but seems to be generally written to Jewish Christians suffering persecution across the ancient world. The opening of James focuses on the concept of suffering and how we might view suffering as a gift in our lives that can help us to understand and better identify with the life of Jesus. Today I'm going to do a little review of this letter and then point us forward as we continue to allow this essential but challenging letter to reorientate our faith life. We heard the theme, living what we say, introduced in that first chapter of James, remember? But be doers of the word, not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseverance, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. This is one of those things that could keep us up at night if we don't humbly ponder ourselves. We we need to just pause and ask ourselves from time to time, How am I doing on the faith journey? Am I living the faith each day? Like am I consistently in the habit of praying? Praying for the world, praying for the needs of people that I know, praying for my own walk. Do I read my Bible? Am I looking for gems in scripture that can guide me on this journey? Will I listen for God's voice from both the pages of my Bible and the leading of the Spirit? Have I intentionally helped others and loved others as myself? It's difficult, but helpful to periodically pause, self-reflect, ask how we're doing along the way. This book of James calls us to forfeit our pride and humbly submit to those needed course adjustments, those corrections that God will give if we're willing to listen and follow. I don't know about you, but in my own faith journey, I struggle with the concept of consistency. I I get what James is saying, and I work at taking the list of things I say and I believe and then try to actually live them out in my life, but it's hard. It's hard to do it each day. It's hard to do it from moment to moment. I would much rather (laughs) and find it so much easier to offer regular evaluation of others than my own life. It's why we gather each week, friends, to encourage each other, to cheer each other on, to help motivate each other to continue to grow in faithfulness. I do need to ask myself more often, does my professed love of Jesus affect what I think about, how I spend my time, how I use my resources, and how I treat others? Because if I claim to love Jesus, but treat people without respect, if I'm rude and disrespectful or neglect obvious needs around me, I'm a hypocrite. I don't truly choose to believe, uh, to live as I believe. Indeed, my words and actions are less than consistent. The book of James truly can help make our faith life more consistent if we're willing to humbly pay attention to its guidance. In chapter two, James wants his listeners to understand more about being a Jesus follower. Jesus says clearly that we are to care for and relate well to others, to not show favoritism. You remember that passage? 
to treat everyone with the same respect that they deserve, to go so far at times to put others first. James 2, 1 to 4 says, My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here in a good place, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Hard words, challenging words, Course adjustment words, if we're willing to listen. Because it's harder than it sounds to live like that. It's a sobering question to ask ourselves, how do I treat someone who can't help me in any way? How do I express their value? So the real encouragement here is to, to not give special favoritism to anyone. Not to the rich or the poor, the sick or the healthy, the oppressed or the favored. The biblical standard is to offer equal grace and equal love to all. A much better way to go about life. We don't have to process it and think about each individual. We just try to live, as Jesus has showed us, with grace and love. James 2 says, So speak and so act as those who are being judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's good news, right? Mercy, we all desire it and are all called to offer it. Once again, this is an issue of being consistent on the journey, right? Do you and I remember that God has shown us tremendous mercy by offering us grace and forgiveness and fresh beginnings and hope and a resurrection? It's the grace we sing about from time to time. It's amazing grace that we can receive. And so our response, James, Suggest should be then to show that same mercy that we so are grateful for to all those around us. And now we arrive at our passage for today from James 4. You did a great job, Jenny, reading it. I'm going to read it again. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that the scripture speaks to no purpose? Does the spirit that God causes to dwell in us desire envy? But God gives all the more grace. Therefore, saying, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself. Therefore, to God, James says. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Very important for us to catch that today. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You would think that James is trying to rob us of the joy of this world. That's not James's intention. But to live the joyful life just intended for ourselves without recognizing the needs and concerns of the world around us isn't helpful. It's not the Jesus way. It motivates us to live in pride and focus on ourselves. Because pride is the focus on oneself. It's the puffing up of oneself and putting ourselves in the front of the line. Throughout scripture, there are reminders and commands to stay humble, to recognize our place. Stay humble, submit to God, 
and live as Jesus showed us. Recovery groups talk about this all the time. How they need to humble themselves and admit that they are powerless without God's help to face complex challenges. It's good advice, isn't it? It's good advice as we face challenges and temptations ourselves. Temptations to turn from God and seek the world. We, friends, are invited to humbly give up trying to do it our own way and turn to and follow God's leading. I know it sounds simple, but it's not, is it? It's hard. But we keep after it. We keep at it. And with God's grace and mercy, we continue on the journey. Maybe you're like me. I face challenges and struggles each day. It's not easy to move forward. It's certainly not easy to move forward in humility, especially as I find myself experiencing many emotions and feelings these days. Emotions that can range from anger and confusion and frustration, which can lead to complaining and hurting and lashing out. But James encourages us to humbly submit again and again and again ourselves to God. Instead of questioning or challenging God, submit ourselves to God, signifying that we're actively looking to God for answers and direction instead of finding ourselves stuck or just blaming God outright for the circumstances around us. We don't like the idea of humility or submission in our culture. I don't like it in my personal life. Do you? But clearly, friends, it's biblical. We read about it in the lives of many characters in scriptures. We should be encouraged by many of their examples to humbly submit to God, submit to one another in love. As the church, we are to lead with love. We know that, don't we? Once again, the scripture calls us to be consistent, to consistently try to live that way, to live with love. Do I live what I say I believe is a good question for us to ask again and again. Because again, it's easy to say that. It's harder to live that. So this morning, I want to whet your appetite a bit for what is coming in the weeks ahead as we continue to work our way through James, the final verses in the final chapter. Because James offers us more wisdom as we glimpse into chapter five. I have found everything James offers is essential to how I live a wise and a God-honoring life. It helps me to see if I'm consistently living the life of faith in and through my day-to-day -day life. Again, a little glimpse of the weeks to come. James 5 says, be patient therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Brothers and sisters, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. Yes, be patient. Patient with yourself, patient with God, patient with each other. But also looking forward to the yield that's coming, the harvest that will be had. James reminds us to be patient with God, patient with ourselves and others, because patience is a virtue, as they say, right? I'm not an exceptionally patient person. But I'm learning to be more patient. How about you? God teaches us so much through waiting. 
Some things I don't want to learn, but God teaches us through waiting. God helps us to learn about ourselves, about others, and about God as we wait. Wait with hope and anticipation. Wait with a trusting heart. Do you have things that you're waiting for? Things that you continue to pray for? What have you learned as you waited? I know that when I recognize God at work in my life or the world around me, after waiting, my faith is empowered. My faith is encouraged. My faith is strengthened. By waiting and watching and then seeing it revealed, God helps us, encourages us down the path. And literally that's how God prepares us for the next challenge ahead. Church, as we wait, see God at work. Find increased hope. We can take more significant amounts of lemons and lousy luck and difficulties and trials, whatever you want to call it, and we can choose to, to make lemonade out of it with God's help. Because I believe hope builds hope. Faith builds faith. And practice is the path to perfection. Perfection, right? The promise is, as we practice our faith, that it will grow stronger. I want to offer one more glimpse into the last chapter of James this morning. James 5, 13. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins can be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth yielded its, its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings them back, a sinner from wandering, will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's a mouthful. Our takeaway for us today can be, are you in trouble? Then pray. Are you happy? Do you find joy? Sing songs of praise and worship to God. Are you sick? Ask for prayer from faithful friends? Are you living in the ramifications of poor choices or habits? Confess it to someone that you trust. Tell someone, tell a friend, tell one of your pastors, get it out. You'll be blessed as you are empowered then to turn away from those choices. To get that fresh beginning that we all need from time to time. We pray for each other because their prayer, our prayers are powerful and effective. Prayers can truly change things. Do you believe that? I should try harder to remember that. How about you? You know, I went to confessional one time in college. It was amazing, although a bit scary. I remember stepping into that little booth, not knowing who was on the other side of the wall. And I poured out those places in my life that I knew I had fallen short. And this voice on the other side, speaking for God, said, blessed child of God, if you seek forgiveness, you are forgiven. Set free. Go and live that life no more. It was freeing. Living that life in community where we 
stand alongside each other. We pray, we listen, we hold each other up. Is James's encouragement to us to be the church as we seek to live like Jesus. And friends, do you know someone who's drifted away from their faith? Maybe the church, an illness, some unanswered prayer, pain or loss has caused them to lose their faith, to stray, to fall away, whatever you want to call it. If you know of someone like that, go after them. Talk to them, encourage them. Encourage them back to the path. Pray for them, talk to them, spend time with them, love them. Because not only may God you use you to be a blessing in their life, but secondly, wouldn't you want that from another if you had lost your way? We know people like that, friends, that we can go to and love them and encourage them. And not only will it help them, not only will it honor our relationship with God, but it will help us. It'll reconvince us of the truth of the path that we're on. James seeks to help us to live the life that he knows is challenging. He's writing to a group of people that know they're being persecuted because of their faith. And he's still saying these same things to them. Why? Because the Spirit is leading him to say, if you live this way, you'll experience the fullness of what God desires for you. It's what Jesus did for us in his life. It's how he showed us to live. And as Jesus followers, aren't we compelled to do likewise? When faith my friends, is released in action, it impacts people's lives. Transformation can happen and people are often set free. I know that personally. I bet many of you do as well. Many years ago, there was a Broadway play and a subsequent movie about a little red-haired orphan girl. She got adopted by a very rich person. This little girl's name and the play that told her story was Annie. A large part of the popularity of that story was because then the main song the, in the play was tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you, tomorrow, you're only a day away. I just proved, I just proved I can't sing. I don't know why I even did that. That little girl had lived a rough life. Do you remember the story? Her parents had died in a car wreck. She had grown up in an orphanage without love and guidance, and she was kidnapped when things were looking up for her. So all that she had to live for was tomorrow. There was nothing of beauty in her day. The thought of tomorrow was a promise of hope. Maybe tomorrow will be better than today. We uh, stop and think, yeah, let's, let's look to tomorrow. Let's focus on tomorrow. The thought of tomorrow is not only a possible source of hope, but also a good excuse to put things off till tomorrow. 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 What I know for sure is we have today and the hope of tomorrow. What's that phrase, why do today what I can put off till tomorrow? You know, the sun has risen every morning for as long as we have been alive. There's no reason to think that the same won't continue. So how about we choose to live humbly in the grace of God, seek to share this with the world around us, and let's start first thing tomorrow. Church, the book of James is all about consistency, humility, practicing what we preach, and faith without works is dead. Are we choosing this life again today? 
The book of James offers true wisdom, my friends, if we really want to be wise followers of Jesus in this life, we must learn to take what we believe in our hearts and minds and live it out wherever the Spirit leads. So with God's promises, with God's help, let's start today, right now. Amen. Lord God, challenging words, inspiring words, hard words, but yet you call us, and we know you love us, and you seek for us to experience the fullness of life, so we're going to trust you. We're going to follow you, and we're going to do it together with the power of your spirit. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.
Amen. I feel like I'm like down in Reedsville, North Carolina, just cutting a rug. That was great. And that question, do you love the Lord? Come on now. That's real stuff. All right, so this is a moment in the service we call uh, the call to generosity. I'd like to invite up Chris Henderson and Sally Mannard. And they're gonna to talk to us a little bit about uh, one of our mission partners, Giving Voice, that is really remarkable and it also keeps along the theme of the music. Uh, good morning, so I'm Chris and this is Sally. We're gonna talk a little bit about Giving Voice Crosstown, how we got involved, what it's about, and how you can support us. So we'll do a little tag team here. Hi, well, Giving Voice, what is Giving Voice? Well, Giving Voice is a chorus for people who are experiencing um, or living with dementia or memory loss of some sort. And it's just an inclusive chorus where really everybody's invited. And we just want you to know that we have that here. And how did it happen to come to our church? Well, my friend Carol Lee invited me to a meeting with Giving Voice Director. And as I listened to them, um, Giving Voice was started at McPhail, um, two choruses down there, and as they were talking, they said, we don't have good parking, uh, our choruses are full, we have a waiting list, and I had what I call a God poke. It's like, we have a wonderful space here for giving voice, and they agreed, and so that's what really started it. It's God's idea, it's what I think is the reason that it's here, and um, we just, we welcome all of you to be a part of Giving Voice. So how I got involved was Sally contacted me and asked if I'd like to get involved. And so the short answer is nobody likes to say no to Sally. So that's how I got involved. Um, but also I was headed towards a retirement in January of 2021. I have a degree in music and my mother had been living with dementia for many years. And so Giving Voice for me was the perfect intersection of my time, talent, and a personal connection. And actually, personal invitation. It started with a personal invitation from Carol Lee. Personal invitation is how things happen. And we started that. We would started inviting people that we knew maybe had caregivers that were had people that they were caring for. We started there. We just started inviting people. We invited the choir because it's open for everyone. We have volunteers that sing with us and uh, help people that need help. And so it's, it's just a wonderful experience for everyone. Now, I'm guessing in this congregation that you know someone that has memory loss. I think all of us know that. Maybe we've even experienced it ourselves. And so we invite you all, we invite you to be recruiters for us and invite people to come because it's a, a wonderful, joyful, social, fun experience. Just like they were singing up here. It's just like that. Well, almost. <laughs> So uh, this ministry, as we said, has been going on since last fall, and uh, it's been going on a little bit quietly in the hearth room at 10 o'clock on Thursdays. Um, and so there are many people who helped us get this off the ground. They include Barb Halverson, Jean Van Heel, Carol Lee Randall, David Henderson, Eric Hansen, Julie Dover, Trev Erickson, Jeff Lindsay, Paul Bertelson, our first director, David Kazizik, and many volunteers both from inside the church and outside, as well as colleagues at the Giving Voice organization. This year we will have a new director. Her name is Debbie Richmond. She comes to us with a background in music therapy, uh, professional roles with the Alzheimer's Association and in nursing homes and senior housing facilities, and she has an accomplished history as a choral singer. So with that background, we are very excited for our second season for Giving Voice Crosstown. And I should mention that we chose the name Giving Voice Crosstown to make it very clear it is for beyond the walls of this church. It is open to anybody anywhere across town can join this chorus. So if you want more information, there's the connection corner out there. There's our website on the missions part of the website. It will explain more too. Chris and I will be out there a little bit today so we can talk to you if you have questions that you want to ask us. But you can test us out. You can come try us. Next Thursday at 10 a.m. in the hearth room, we're doing a sing-along. Fun songs, probably songs you know, most of them anyway. And Dave Henderson, will be our director for that one. And so if you have been in the choir before with Dave, you know how wonderful that is. So you can just come and enjoy that again. And then we have another opportunity, our second 
uh, season starts in the fall, and it's uh, September 15th, again a Thursday, 10 a.m. It's an open house, so you again can come and just kind of try us out and see if you like it. Bring a friend. We would just love to have you. Treats, too. We're going to have treats. So, <laughs> And I would like to add my thank yous to this church for being so open and so generous with uh, space and with all sorts of things that have allowed us to offer this, and to Chris, who, if you don't know, if you want something done, ask Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have to make one final comment. Sally has talked about how you are all, all welcome to come observe, participate, whatever, um, and really see what a difference this course makes in the lives of people who are experiencing memory loss or their family, their caregivers, those who attend the concerts. It's very meaningful. And you just heard this line sung earlier that I think really sums up the power of the ministry. I hear music in the air. I can feel it everywhere. There must be a God somewhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sally and Chris, and thank you for all who are participating in Giving Voice. Uh, there are many different ways to get involved with your time, with your talents. Uh, you can also, of course, uh, continue to support uh, the ministries here through uh, your donations. Uh, as you can see on the screen, there are different ways to do that online. Uh, you can go to meetinghouse.church backslash give uh, via your mobile device, or we also, of course, have a giving box out front, or you can mail us a check. Uh, that's perfectly fine. The key, though, is giving freely, giving um, cheerfully, giving from the heart. And so that's what we want to encourage here at Meeting House Church. Let's pray, brothers and sisters, for the gifts that will come in, whether it's the gift of song, the gift of service, or the gift of our money. Lord, we thank you so much for this day that we are, when we are reminded that indeed you are the giver of all good gifts, that you have indeed given us the gift of breath that we might sing to you and to one another. This gift reaches down deep inside of us. We pray, Lord, that you will take all of the various gifts, the various ways that we respond to your calls to us to be generous, that you will multiply it, that it might glorify your name, and it might be for the betterment of our neighbor. We ask and pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to invite you as you're able to please stand for our closing hymn, Longing for Light, We Wait in Darkness, number 314.
First of all, I'd like to thank John Carson, who's here with us. <laughs> Kathy, who's our, our organist. This is her son, who's just come back from Germany, where he's been studying music. And apparently, he passed all his classes. So we're really glad that you're here. We're so glad that you would share your town with us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you to that, that ensemble. I mean, for goodness sakes, I do have one bone to pick. To sing that song after I get done preaching means nobody's going to remember my sermon. <laughs> so, you know, next time tank it a little bit for me, will you? No, that was amazing. It was a great, as Jenny said, the one-two punch for us this morning. We have uh, some donuts and some coffee. We'd love for you to gather for a few minutes, maybe meet a new friend. I know we have visitors with us today, a chance to meet a new friend. So look out for someone that you don't know and, and welcome them. And if they tell you they've been here for 10 years, it's fine. It's okay, but we'd love for you to just hang around a bit. You know, as we think about the book of James and his encouragement to us, we just get to step out in faith, trusting that God's going to lead. We, we have done what we need to do in setting the, the stage. We have sung some songs that have revealed truth to us. We have opened up God's word and has shown us the way. I've tried to offer a few ideas of how that can live out in our life. We've, we've got what we need to go back to the world, and we got what we need because God has promised to be with us. And we have each other to walk this journey together. Amen? Amen. Go in the, in the knowledge that God loves you, that God is at work bringing you on to completion, and God will be with you every step of the way. God bless you.